This is the final lecture from the light chapter, so let's get to it. We just learned how emission and absorption line spectra allow us to determine the chemical composition of astronomical objects. Now we're going to see how light can tell us the temperatures of planets of stars and how light can tell us the speed of a distant object. Most objects we encounter on a regular basis are not like the clouds of gas we thought about when learning about spectra. Things like people, coffee cups, or cookies are solid. A cookie, for example, absorbs light across a broad range of wavelengths. Light cannot easily pass through a cookie, and light emitted inside of a cookie cannot easily escape. In this respect, large, dense objects like planets and stars are similar to cookies. Consider our cookie. It's an ideal cookie that absorbs all the photons that strike it and does not allow photons inside of it to escape easily. If we shine photons on our cookie, the atoms in our cookie absorb the light. Let's zoom into the cookie as we shine our flashlight on it. Here we are, zoomed deep within the cookie. The photons from the flashlight will bounce randomly around inside of the cookie, constantly exchanging energy with other atoms or molecules. By the time the photons finally escape, their energies are random and spread over a wide range of wavelengths or colors. Therefore, if we take a spectrum of our cookie, it will have all the colors. It will be continuous. Our cookie emits all photons with all wavelengths, but the shape of the cookie spectrum will depend on its temperature. A really hot cookie will emit a larger number of higher energy photons, so its spectrum would be peaked on the shorter wavelength side. Remember, this is what a graph of a continuous spectrum looks like. The intensity and where the curve peaks will depend on the object's temperature. Therefore, we call this spectrum a thermal radiation spectrum. Here is a thermal radiation spectrum of our hot cookie. And here is the thermal radiation spectrum of a cookie that is not quite as hot. And finally, here is the thermal radiation spectrum for a cooler cookie. The thermal radiation spectrum of a cookie or any object depends on its temperature. There are two things to notice about these spectra. First, the hotter the cookie, the more intensity there is at all wavelengths. And second, the spectral curve peaks at a shorter wavelength for the hotter cookie and a longer wavelength for the cooler cookie. These two observations form two laws of thermal radiation. The first law is known as the Stefan-Boltzmann law. Each square meter of a hotter object's surface emits more light at all wavelengths. For example, each square meter on the surface of a 15,000 Kelvin star emits a lot more light at every wavelength than each square meter of the 3,000 Kelvin star. Here are the thermal radiation spectra of the two stars. We see that the hot star has a higher intensity at all wavelengths compared to the cooler star. The Stefan-Boltzmann law can be expressed mathematically. The emitted power per area is equal to a constant times the temperature raised to the fourth power. The constant sigma is the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. We usually put temperature on the Kelvin scale. Note that the emitted power is very strongly dependent on the object's temperature. The second radiation law is Wien's law, which says hotter objects emit photons with a higher average energy. Higher energy means a shorter wavelength. This is why the peak of the spectra for a hot blue star is at a shorter wavelength than for a cool red star. And here is Wien's law expressed mathematically. Lambda max is the wavelength in nanometers of the maximum intensity, which is the peak of the thermal radiation spectrum. The temperature is again on the Kelvin scale. 
Note that the larger the temperature, the smaller or the shorter the lambda max is, as expected. You may have noticed that stars are not all the same color. Hot stars appear more blue, like the blue giant star Rigel in the constellation Orion. Rigel has a surface temperature of about 11,000 Kelvin. Cooler stars appear orange-red, like Betelgeuse. It has a surface temperature of only 3,500 Kelvin. Very hot objects emit even shorter wavelength photons, even x-rays. We'll talk about some of these very energetic celestial phenomena later in the semester. Believe it or not, there is even more we can learn from light. We can learn about the motion of distant objects from changes in their spectra, caused by what's known as the Doppler effect. You may have noticed the Doppler effect on the sound of an ambulance siren. If the ambulance is stationary, the pitch of its siren sounds the same no matter where you stand. If the ambulance is traveling toward you, the pitch sounds higher. The waves are bunched up between you and the ambulance, giving them a shorter wavelength and therefore a higher frequency or higher pitch. As the ambulance moves away from you, the sound waves get stretched out. You hear a lower frequency or a lower pitch. Because of the Doppler effect, an ambulance passing you on the street sounds like this. The Doppler effect causes a similar shift in the wavelengths of light. If an object is moving toward us, the light waves bunch up between us and the object, so its entire spectrum is shifted to shorter wavelengths. Because shorter wavelengths of visible light are more blue, the Doppler shift of an object coming towards us is called a blue shift. If an object is moving away from us, its light is shifted to longer wavelengths. We call this Doppler shift a red shift because longer wavelengths of visible light are more red. Spectral lines provide the reference points we use to identify and measure Doppler shifts. For example, suppose we recognize the pattern of hydrogen lines in the spectrum of a distant galaxy. We know where the lines should show up if the galaxy is not moving from looking at hydrogen in the laboratory. If the hydrogen lines from a galaxy appear at longer wavelengths, then we know they are redshifted and the galaxy must be moving away from us. The larger the shift, the faster the galaxy is moving. If the hydrogen lines in the galaxy appear at shorter wavelengths, then we know that they are blue shifted and the galaxy is moving toward us. Again, the larger the shift, the faster the galaxy is moving. The Doppler effect is limited in that it can tell us only the part of an object's full motion that is directed toward or away from us, or its radial velocity. Consider three stars all moving at the same speed, with one moving directly away from us, one moving across our line of sight, and one moving diagonally away from us. The Doppler shift will tell us the full speed of only the first star. It will not give any speed for the second star because none of this star's motion is directed toward or away from us. For the third star, the Doppler shift will tell us only the part of the star's velocity that is directed away from us. The Doppler effect can also be used to determine rotation rates. Imagine a planet or star. As it rotates, one edge is moving toward us and one edge is moving away. The edge that is moving toward us is blue shifted. The edge that is moving away is red shifted. The center of the object won't have any Doppler shift. The net effect, if we are looking at the whole rotating star at once, is to make each spectral line appear wider than it would if the object were not rotating. The faster the object is rotating, the broader the spectral lines become. We can therefore determine the rotation rate of a distant object by measuring the width of its spectral lines. Almost everything we know about the universe comes from a careful analysis of light. We may not be able to bring a star into an earthly laboratory for measurement, but using the light that it emits, we are able to determine chemical composition, temperature, and motion. And now you know how it's done. 
that's it for chapter five. You really deserve a treat for working through all of this. So get yourself a mocha or even a cookie or two. I will talk to you soon.